Welcome. Today we're talking about the genesis of U32, Union High School District number 32, a uh, rural super supervisory union district that was formed in the um, formed in the 60s with the school opening in the fall of 1971. I'm Betty Keller. I went to U32 um, as starting as an eighth grader when it opened, and I now live in St. Johnsbury. And I have with me here today a guest. Alice Blatchley, the mother of um, one of my friends, two of my friends at U32, and um, she served on the school board. So she has the perspective of a community member, a taxpayer, a voter, a mother, and a school board member. And so we're going to have a conversation today about how did we come up with this idea of starting up such a progressive school in the middle of central Vermont in the 60s in a rural area? Thank you so much for being with us today, Alice. I'm delighted. <laughs> it's uh, great to see you again. It's been a number of years since I've yes. seen you. <laughs> and um, so could you talk a little bit, just to get us started talking about, um, you know, central Vermont in the 60s, a lot of farmers, people who, some people worked in Montpelier for the government, people worked in school systems, hospitals, whatever. Um, what kind of culture was there and how did, we end up with a school like this. <laughs> well, it's an awfully good question. And uh, I remember asking the same thing, and <laughs> my friends too. This is amazing. I mean, this school, had, it just seemed to just just come up out of nowhere, because certainly the, well, Vermont had originally uh, w the one-room schools, which were marvelous. I've heard about them, and I do think that they provided a really fine education. Um, the teachers had to be very creative, they had to be very resourceful, the children learned from each other, the younger ones would listen in, there were no walls at all, so, and the grades weren't separated, so it, that was um, just in hearing, I've known people who went through that system and I've been impressed, even when I first came, I remember how impressed I was, how well spoken, um, and uh, how well they listened, and uh, the thinking for themselves. These are people thought for themselves. And I just thought that in some ways, those one room schools embodied some of the principles of progressive education. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they, they had, had to, to <laughs> use whatever resources they had at hand if they didn't have, there was very little money. So sometimes take a Sears robot catalog and you know, use that as a kind of for scrapbooks or for, to make almost mosaics of things. I mean, just, you know. So uh, then um, they graduated from that, of course, to the uh, graded system and, and um, schools, elementary schools in each town and, and so on. And of course, at that time, most towns didn't have a high school, many of the smaller towns. So they would tuition their students but the students had a choice of any school, any high school, like you could go to, in our area, in Montpelier High School, you could go to Spalding and Barry, or you could even go, some uh, people went to St. Johnsbury Academy, you could go there. Oh, really, I hadn't heard yes, that one mentioned. I've heard could. Hardwick mentioned and Northfield sure High School. I'm not when that started, but yes, you could go to St. Johnsbury. Yeah. And, you know, so there was a lot of choice there. But I think it was the reasons for consolidating probably were largely economic. I mean, it was that was the way that kind of the school, the Department of Education went around uh, uh, discussing this among the voters and uh, and pointed out that by consolidating, you know, you could, it would be more economical to ordering supplies and doing all that kind right, of right. thing, and that also uh, there were new. Well, you know, there, there was new ideas in the air throughout the country. Mm -hmm. New, uh, there was progressive ideas. The more wealthier uh, districts in the country had more progressive. That that idea was taking hold, mm -hmm. and um, so maybe, I think Vermont was sl a little slower to learn that. Right. So maybe a little background for our viewers is that um, when we're talking about the towns, we're talking about East Montpelier, Middlesex, Worcester. Berlin and Callis. Mm -hmm. And so Montpelier is smack in the middle of that. <laughs> and then East Montpelier and Callis, Berlin, Middlesex, and Worcester. So they were all surrounding Montpelier. So a good number of people did choose to send their children to Montpelier, 
mostly for transportation. There was no busing. So parents had to figure out, how do I get my, tra my high school kids to, to school? Mm -hmm. When they got to be juniors or seniors, they might be able to drive, or they might have a friend who could drive them, but you had to afford an extra car if that were the case. Um, but so a lot of choosing the school wasn't based on the educational philosophy or what was the best match for my kid's learning style. It was more about how can I get my kid to school? And so True. people in Berlin might go to Northfield, for instance. People mm -hmm. in East Montpelier or Callis might go over to it may have been Plainfield High School before Twinfield was started. Quite a few. And then, and the Plainfield. Hardwick is north of there, so mm -hmm. there was a school up there that people went to. Um, St. Johnsbury Academy, that would be a hike. And I don't know how many of those kids ended up yes, living in dormitories. I don't know. Yeah. That but, yeah. but basically, the towns would pay the tuition to whichever school mm -hmm. the family chose, mm -hmm. and then the student would go there. It was the parents' responsibility to get them there. Well, some students actually boarded. I mean, in the old days, that's what they did. There were two women from Callis who, uh, they were the only ones in there, they were from the Adamant region, the only ones who wanted to go to high school. So they went on and they, and they boarded with a family, each of them, in and it had jobs to do. They had to wash dishes or maybe look after the kids. Boarded where? Uh, to a Montpelier oh, okay. High School. And they would come back and visit their families over the, week, over the weekend, uh -huh. the farm families. And believe it or not, these women walked 12 miles no matter what the weather. On Monday Absolutely. morning to get there? Absolutely. Oh, well, I've talked to them. Wow. Yes. I said, you really did even when it was late at night or you know, 50 below zero or something? She said, oh, yeah, we, we were used to it. I couldn't get over wow. that. These were wow. tough so, people in those days. Right. So this is before we had school busing. My husband, mm -hmm. I remember, used to get picked up by the mail carrier to take, be taken to the Mabel Corner School. Well, yeah. You could and work then out stuff. I forget what was worked out for when he went to Woodbury, before he went to Berlin. But during high school, mm -hmm. his father drove him there in the morning. And mm -hmm. went to work, and then he went and That's hung right. out at Kellogg Hubbard Library after school until his father could pick him up and take him back. Yeah, I was speaking with um, Houghton Kate's son, Richard Kate, mm -hmm. and he said that um, from his perspective, it was his life to just accept that he couldn't be on any teams, be on any theater programs, or anything That's right. because no he, extracurricular. Because he couldn't get yeah. home afterward. You know, he mm -hmm. had there was one time he could catch a ride, and if he didn't get that ride, that was it. Yeah. And so even if for students from the area, from those small towns, even if they did have a reliable transportation, the coaches and, and you know, advisors of these groups kind of took it for granted that they couldn't count on them. So these kids That's were passed true. over for parts. And I think that was a very strong reason for wanting to have to consolidate and have the, mm -hmm. the um, for those towns too. It, it wasn't really fair. To, right. So one yeah. thing is they could participate more in those ex extracurricular yeah. activities. The yeah. other thing is that the townspeople could vote to fund the busing because mm -hmm. you weren't voting on Montpelier's you know, budget and, mm -hmm. and you weren't getting input with your own school board member to make a decision to add bus busing to the Montpelier yeah. budget. Mm -hmm. So that was never really a choice. So mm -hmm. now they would have control over being able to have a voice on how their kids could get there. Yeah. Busing, of course, being a huge problem. Y yes. And it then you're talking about right. Yeah. You're talking about after school and again after activities. So that's an expense, right? Yeah. So to get back, I just wanted to kind of give that background mm -hmm. to get back to more about um, the beginnings of the school. Where did these ideas um, come from? Well, I don't really know because I wasn't on the original school board. I joined it in was it seventy two, seventy three, somewhere right but, in there. Yeah. But um, I just know. Well, I know what. Um, Rosendo Cueto, otherwise known as Rosie, would tell me about this. Uh, they, of course, the, the board had to hire a principal. They chose this man, Bill Grady from New Jersey, who happened to be a very dynamic guy and very much de uh, uh, devoted to the principles of progressive education. And so he had all these great ideas that were being done in the uh, New Jersey schools. And um, so I guess the board just liked what they heard, and they did. Uh, they had other choices, but they did decide to go with what he meant, he suggested. And um, so that had a lot to do with it. But I give the board a lot of credit for being very open-minded. They did not want to just do things the same old way. We wanted to do something. I must be. I mean, I wasn't there then, but it was a fresh start. We want, and we want to 
have these children to have all the advantages that they can have, you know, the best kind of education, so that we'll prepare them the best for, for the, the world they're going to be working and going to be actually, you know, mm -hmm. being running, I mean, in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, he worked with them, and one of the things they did, um, the school was, the plans for the, the architectural plans were already drawn up, but he wanted them to look at a few schools that he had, in the, so that they, they, knew, they had options for what kind of school would be. And one of the schools they went to was a school in Maine. And Rosie said, we know, we looked, we saw these children. They were, um, so there was some fluidity moving back and forth between classes. And it was very open. And the, the atmosphere in the school was altogether different from anything. They weren't sitting in chairs all looking at the student. It was not authoritarian. They run, they weren't just you know, taking dictation or always uh, saying back what the teacher had said, anything like that. Each child was um, very busy at something purposeful that they were had planned, helped to plan themselves, and they were able, though, to learn a lot just from interacting more with uh, the others and seeing what other people were doing. And they all said, that's what we want. Every single member of the school board said, he said, we want that kind of a school. Now, that was pretty darn good. That's pretty interesting. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that school board. So this had to be a few years before the physical building was yes. built and mm -hmm. the staff were hired to go in. Now, I'm not sure exactly when they would have hired Grady. Sounds like they were hiring him for at least some consulting, even though the school wasn't built and he wasn't working as a principal. He could have been a consultant. Yeah, and I, that I don't know. Yeah. I don't know any. I'm but, hazy but, on but all that. But before the building was fine, had the finishing touches on it, certainly he was consulted well, yes, and they saw these other schools. And he did make some changes to the, yeah. and they, they endorsed mm -hmm. that. Go ahead and make whatever changes to the physical layout. Mm -hmm. to, a, to a, a, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether it was his idea or the school boards, but probably... I don't know, but he wanted the library to be at the center. Uh -huh. Library shouldn't be off somewhere. That should be the, the the nerve center almost of the school. And I totally felt as a student that that and, was the heart of the school. Yeah, and he wanted it to be very open. People could pass through. You didn't have to be a place where you, shh, shh, you had to be so quiet. And, uh, I mean, not that anybody was loud, but I mean, you were there to study, you were there to learn, but you could, yeah, and actually it had a nice rug and students were actually allowed to sit on the rug and study. That was, of course, a bone of contention among those people who were, who were very upset with the school because it was so non-traditional. Mm -hmm. It was a shock. I mean, they, they were willing to think of some changes, but not anything. To sit on this, to sit, I mean, right. it seemed disrespectful so to the teachers and so on. So each town had one, two, or three members on the school board that they voted in. So of these five towns, they each chose people who participated on the school board, and those people who went to Maine all appreciated and were enthusiastic about this new model of learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just to talk a little bit about those towns. So East Montpelier and Callis were actually close to Plainfield, which is where Goddard College is. That's right. So and they, so mm -hmm. there would be there would be faculty who were living in some of those towns, for instance, as well as the you know the farmers and everybody else who's there. Um, so can you talk a little bit about some of these other school influences? The new school you had mentioned to me earlier. Um, just talk a little bit about some of those, maybe. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think it was a rather remarkable board. I, as I say, uh, I wasn't on the original board. I came on uh, just a year or two after it started. Right, when Rosie, when, but uh, when it was Houghton a remarkable Kate's, group of yeah. people. Mm -hmm. We had Houghton Kate from East Callis, a, a very fine man. I mean, I, mm -hmm. everybody said Houghton Kate is just one of the finest people I've ever met. You know? mm -hmm. um, and um, Rosendo Cueto, who was and he told me that he originally, I'm not sure how he got on, but he was interested in civic affairs, always very involved. And he just, I say remarkable, I think, because they were open-minded mm -hmm. enough to, I mean, they had very set ideas, but they were willing to listen and to um, be, have their minds changed. I mean, right. um, 
and uh, so, so there was a Mr. Magnet, Charles. Was it called Charlie? Magnet? Oh, okay. These are hardworking people who believed that you should take part in community affairs, that you had a responsibility, civic responsibility. They took it very seriously, mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but in any case, they represented the districts they represented were quite different. Berlin, um, the we uh, there was a um, member there. Was it one or two? Let's see, Ruthtown was from East Montpelier, I guess. She was later, though. She wasn't on the original board. Oh, she was. came so on. So there All was right. a, a Mr. So Wells. at the first, the board, mm -hmm. they liked Mr. Grady's ideas and so on and everything. Mm -hmm. But it at some point, and this was the point at which I got on the board, I was asked to, to run by some people who were really concerned that the school's philosophy was in danger, in danger of losing it because... Um, <clears throat> I think partly because of the, the maybe there were cost overruns, people were concerned, so particularly in Berlin for some reason, uh, maybe because there were more uh, pe persons who were concerned about property taxes rising. There was a, a large uh, mm -hmm. um, people who, well, there was uh, trailer parks and so on. I don't know if that had something to do with it. I mean, people who really could yeah. not afford much yeah, so I more. had a hypothesis on that too. I think that Berlin may have been earlier than some of the other schools on having a regular graded system with a lot more structure. They were, and yeah. like like Calis well, in any case, still had the one room school. I just w w was told that the, so the it began to uh, this groundswell of opposition began to get very serious, and unfortunately, the anger and the stuff all fell on to Bill Grady. He was the magnet for it. Mm -hmm. And he took a great deal of, I mean, it was very difficult. People were very, very upset. And um, they, what they, they centered, uh, the, some of the things they really objected to were the, the fact that the children were allowed to call the teachers by their first names. Yeah, That just seemed wrong. I think they were concerned about the emphasis on the arts, music and arts and, and so on. Uh, as not being a good preparation for these right. for, for life for for having job they were very concerned about being able to get a job you if right. progress <clears throat> from what they'd heard about progressive education well tell them just do whatever they've a mind I've heard people say something like that mm -hmm. but I mean actually if you think about it the point of progressive education is to prepare the kids really prepare them for life. Right. They learn to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to have to do. Right. And the whole, as a matter of fact, now as we see, the whole economic thing has changed so that you don't have a job for life. It's all of that. So you really need to be able to think on your feet and to be able to integrate ideas and, and be, mm -hmm. um, I'll say, think for yourself. That was right. really important. Right, I think, yeah, and a lot of concern was the lack of structure so that students... They were worried. Were, yeah, students were able to yeah. choose their classes or they yeah. could choose to have more free time as long as they got yeah. enough credits in. And actually, there was some cause for concern because the um, this was an ideal school for some kids. Some kids mm -hmm. were well prepared for it. Um, my son, Tom, um, he had gone to a very progressive um, elementary school. It was one that was open, formed by some parents who wanted something different for their kids. And it was a while public school kids could go there. Uh, we had very few people who, who wanted to do that. We did have one student, I remember. But he learned there, I mean, just to figure out for himself what he wanted to do. And, how, and so one of the teachers said to me, your son is the son this I mean he the, this school was made for something like that he knew what he wanted to do uh, there was free time he usually um, would use it playing chess <coughs> and um, the teachers there but, I mean chess is really very good for your mind developing I mean, you know, strategy so, yeah and so on planning. or you could watch a film apparently mm -hmm. you didn't have traditional study halls with somebody over there making sure that the students had to learn to discipline themselves and take responsibility for themselves. The idea <clears> being, they're going to have to learn that. You've got to learn to take responsibility. Why not start learning it mm -hmm. in school? Why, mm -hmm. why wait? What are you uh, preparing them for if it's just rote learning? So, um, but then there were some students, and students, of course, tend to um, 
group together of like people, like you know themselves. So there were some uh, people and uh, students. I don't know how many, but they would tend to uh, isolate themselves from the others. They didn't understand what to do. They weren't prepared for that much freedom, and mm -hmm. so on. So um, and I, I'm not the best one to to uh, say what happened there because I think it was a problem for some time and the teachers had to figure out how to, they worked about it, they were concerned about it. The whole school was concerned. Mm -hmm. And um, so, because that's exactly what you didn't want. You didn't want um, people, um, you know, going off into their separate, uh, you wanted all the students of, from all different backgrounds and everything to mingle together and for the program to be good for everybody. So, in any case, um, that that, um, but I think the the central thing about that school, the thing that ultimately sold it to the parents and to the kids themselves, was the teacher advisor system. This was an innovation on Bill Grady's part. I don't think any other school had it. When the student enters, they get a teacher advisor who will sort of see them, talk with them and help them sort of make the best use of the school for their, figure out you know, all kinds of things. You know, at that time in your life, in adolescence, they're full of all kinds of, but they're not quite sure you know, how to mm -hmm. negotiate things, how to manage. And so they need someone, a, an older person who will be their friend, mm -hmm. really be their friend and add, almost like their advocate, help them to make the best possible use of the school and get to know their parents. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a teacher, Gene Novogrossky, he was terrific. And he would go and uh, pretty much invite himself to have dinner with the family. And he did, um, I remember there was a school board member, Bob, can't remember his last name. He said his son used to hate school. It was such a chore trying to get a kid to go to school. Mm -hmm. But Gene, he, he had Gene for a teacher advisor. And Gene would go home and sit with them and they have dinner and stuff. Oh, my and I didn't know this. He noticed, he, Bob, noticed that he really liked going to school and that he was doing so much better. He was learning math, which had always been something he couldn't seem to get because here was somebody who was interested in him and caring about him and what he thought and just helping him to, um, he said it made all the difference. And he said, that's what sold me on the school. Mm -hmm. He said, I was, Doubtful, I was skeptical, but after when I saw what it did for my son, he said, oh, you know, mm -hmm. that's absolutely. Yeah. So Gene was, he said at first, well, I was a little doubtful because Gene had a macrame belt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something about a macrame belt, that signified, you know, it's kind of um, uh, 60s ish, you mm -hmm. know, kind of whatever. But he said, well, I, did, I figured out the belt wasn't very important. <laughs> he was great. Uh -huh. All these people. Mm -hmm. Now, even now, there was one who, it was kind of a, 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 it became very polarized when I got on. And I was told that. And I said, look, we're worried. Because the, the progressive the parents who were used to more progressive school, who had come from somewhere else, Many of them, uh, some of them, you know, a teachers at Goddard, which has a very um, progressive philosophy coming from Dewey, John Dewey's philosophy, you know, learning by doing and so on. And um, they said there, there was, uh, the opposition was very strong and uh, they, we were really afraid that, that somehow or other there would be a vote to turn the school's philosophy back to, to eliminate all of the good features. And we were worried for our children and, and just thought it would be a shame. So um, I got on because I was very progressive and I did have to, I went around and talked to people mm -hmm. and um, I went on with the express purpose of really trying to, um, to, to, to fight for, the, for what the school was doing and to try to uh, help people see uh, uh, how positive it was. So when you and, say you know, to fight for what the school was and to maintain that philosophy, does that mean that you were going out and talking to more parents who you knew were opposed to it to try to help? No, no, it was just through, within the, we had to, uh, 
uh, at school board meetings, you know, the, we had to uh, decide on kind of all these issues. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to represent the point okay. of view that felt the school was really something worth saving that was really good for the right. school and that um, they answer the objections, uh, but um, talk about the real issues. There was a tendency for people to kind of attack it from this budget. That would be one way to get it uh -huh, done. Right. And I mean, some of the opposition was, um, it was kind of hard to really argue about it, but you could, you could uh, state your point of view and, mm -hmm. and uh, don't back down. But listen to the others, and we had to all learn to do that, which we actually did, which was surprising. Because mm -hmm. I remember there was one member, uh, Ruth Town, and I was kind of warned us that you, you, you will find her very difficult to deal with. And she was indeed, because she was very uh, so sure that she was right about this and that and the other. And children are not going to learn anything, and this is terrible. I think she took her own son out of the school because she she was afraid it was just going to it was going to be a terrible kind of education. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how, but I know that we um, ended up good friends. I came to realize that some of the stuff I agreed with her, and there was one thing that we had in common. We both cared passionately about education, about our children. She cared passionately about education, and so did I, from different points of view. Mm -hmm. And that was really good. Yeah. And I said that to her, and I said, well, you know, when I could agree, I did. And um, that was a revelation to me that you could, and I think to her too, you could uh, disagree very much, but you could Still respect, respect the each other. other. I love oh. that. I want to end on that note. That is so wonderful that you can disagree, mm -hmm. but find your common ground that you mm -hmm. both have this passion that you care about, yeah. and you're going to work together, yeah. even though you disagree. But yeah, wonderful. I wish we could all do that today. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today, Alice, oh, goodness, and thank it. you for listening. And we'll be having more um, conversations on this and. Uh, carrying on with Alice, uh, the conversation, but also with others. Thank you so much for joining us. Initially, in 1967, Union 32 included Montpelier, East Montpelier, Callis, Middlesex, and Worcester. In 1968, Montpelier withdrew, and Berlin moved from Union 31 to Union 32. The trip to Maine in February of 1968 was to look at how a district with similar demographics worked, with a central, larger town surrounded by rural towns, while Mil Montpelier was still in the Union. The field trip to see a progressive school in action was to New Hampshire. The composition of the board at the time of these field trips was nine members from Montpelier, two from East Montpelier, and one each from Callis, Middlesex, and Worcester. Twelve of the 14 members visited the progressive school in New Hampshire and were favorably impressed. The other two, Bill Doyle of Montpelier and Bill Sargent of Worcester, who traveled later and spoke directly with teachers, were not happy with what they found. See Bill Sargent speak about it on The Genesis of U32, The Rural Context. After Montpelier withdrew and Berlin joined, East Montpelier and Berlin each had two board members, and Callis, Middlesex, and Worcester each had one board member. No towns had three members. Ruth Town represented Berlin. Her oldest son, Owen Town attended Montpelier High School for grades 9 to 11 and then attended U32, where he was in the first graduating class in 1972. He shares his perspective in From Berlin's Berry Road Schoolhouse to Zoo 32. He also contributes to The Genesis of U32, The Rural Context. His younger brother, Brad, attended Montpelier for a year, then U32, and then transferred back to Montpelier High School.